ethnic units, such as Mahar's Irish Brigade, demonstrated that recent immigrants would prove loyalty to their new nation with blood. Other ethnic soldiers, especially German regiments, such as the 45th New York Infantry, demonstrated their strong Federalist loyalties and their abolitionist sentiments as well. The 45th New York and the other German regiments of the Army of the Potomac would raise and muster all German regiments, especially in immigrant strongholds such as New York and Cincinnati. The 45th New York was part of a strong group of New York City regiments, and they took on the proud title of the 5th German Rifles. Their commander was Colonel George von Amsberg, an experienced soldier and a veteran of the Hungarian Revolution. A large portion of the officer corps of these German regiments had similar wartime experience in Europe. The 45th and many of its fellow regiments served in the 11th Corps of the Army of the Potomac. The Corps was built of a majority of German and European regiments and many officers commanded their men in their German language to the disdain of their Anglo comrades. True dismay and distrust of the Germans came at the Battle of Chancellorsville in May 1863. The 11th Corps was caught in its flank by Stonewall Jackson's famous May 2nd attack. Several regiments of the 11th Corps, but not all German, could not even form their ranks, and the startled Yankees broke and ran. But the 45th New York fought well. But after this battle, the Germans were scapegoats for Hooker's defeat. Two months later, at Gettysburg and on the fields north of town, the 45th New York acted as an advance screen, finding the Confederate positions on Oak Hill. The entire 11th Corps took the field to reclaim their fighting reputation, and the Corps saved the Army of the Potomac from another complete rout and defeat in the streets of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania with legendary tenacity. Once the men were in camp, there were a handful of responsibilities needing attention, especially making sure your musket was clean, rations cooked, and then making your house for the night. Mr. Lincoln's army, except when in winter huts, lived in the canvas houses known as dog tents or shelter tents. Each man was provided with an elongated square sheet of duck, about five and a half feet long, and bedecked with a few dozen bone buttons and buttonholes. Two men usually stuck their bayoneted muskets in the ground for end poles, then buttoning their two shelter tents together to form a long rectangular sheet. Two middle buttonholes were placed in the hammers of the two muskets, and sticks or issue wooden pegs were driven into the ground on each corner, a simple, easy and primitive shelter from the sky. The men would use their Indian rubber blankets on the ground, sometimes atop pine needles or leaves as their mattresses. Their woolen issue blankets weighed between four and five pounds and unless it was below freezing would be wrapped around the men to keep them just warm enough. Pillows were fashioned from knapsacks or a bundle of extra shirt and socks. When not on duty and allowed to wander to amusements, the men craved a few things, 
such as reading newspapers to find more information on the war than in their immediate little corner of it. Apart from that, it was easy for men to transport playing cards, and they would play several forms of betting games, at times betting their rations when they hadn't received pay for several months. The men would have boxing or wrestling matches, tossing messmates or drummer boys in a blanket, and when in more static camps, bigger games like baseball. Some men even dabbled in amusements that their families could never even comprehend, like racing lice or ticks. But when the bugle or drum sounded, the men were ordered to pack up to move on to another campaign, and they did. The men carried their world in an issue knapsack, or were more akin to just carry a few things in a horseshoe or looped blanket roll over their shoulder. A veteran soldier typically laid out his army blanket, placed an extra shirt and socks on it, folded it a dozen times, or rolled it, then twisted it slightly, tied the ends, and threw it over his head, and had it rest on either hip to his own comfort. <laughs> 